Hi everyone, Peter Grad here from the Purple House. Hello, How are everyone. you? Um, tonight we are going to do something different to what we normally do because we can't answer your questions anymore because we are being censored and we have to be totally compliant. That means we can't talk about any illnesses anymore, at least not on Facebook or social media. Um, we've decided to, to change tech or shift gears a little bit and um, allow you to have a look into our lives and, and we, so we're going to make it a bit more personal which you will probably enjoy anyway because you'll be able to relate to heaps of stuff that Pete and I have been through in our 40 something years of being together. So behind us <laughs> you see this uh, photo of our wedding day when I had just turned 19 and Peter was just 20 something. What 23. 23. I had a little bit more hair there as well. Yeah, Peter was like a bush <laughs> ranger from Tasmania and I was a schoolgirl from near Amsterdam with big plans of going to university and all the rest. And then instead I moved to Tasmania and had six children and lived in the in the bush with Peter for many years before we resurfaced and opened the clinic 20 years ago. So we've had 20 really, really awesome, amazing years at the Purple House and we're still going to continue, by the way. We just have to be very wise what we say to you in regards to health. So We want to keep you really healthy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we, we want everyone to live a life that, they don't have any, that you don't have any regrets. <clears throat> when you die um, because statistics show that when people are on their deathbed they always regret uh, they wish they'd done more or something mm. like that and um, in regards to this I'm going to interview Peter <laughs> hopefully we still have like 40 really good years ahead of us but I want to interview Peter because Peter did something really really special last year <clears throat> to make sure and it's almost come to fruition yeah um, that he uh, doesn't have any regrets later on. So Pete, um, okay, I'll tell you what he did. He wrote a book in his spare time and uh, it's been published, it's on Amazon and the hard copy will be in our shop probably next week. I'll let you know in next week's Facebook Live. So I'm going to ask Pete, um, what was it like for you to write a, a book a memoir it is actually. And, and what triggered you to do it? What triggered me to do it was I wanted to get to know myself a lot better. I took a week off. When was that? It doesn't I, matter. It was through the winter and I shut myself away in a room by myself and I just began writing and it just downloaded. I found my pen just scribbling across the page and it was yeah snippets of my life story from birth to when I met Grada or just after I met Grada and which was the end of his it's, life <laughs> it's quite yeah it uh, is quite revealing you you yeah I, I, would you recommend it I would recommend it to everyone and even if even if your story only helps yourself, it's well worth writing. But it'll most likely help lots of other people mm -hmm. who read it. And I did it for myself, but I'm sure my children will thoroughly enjoy it. Lisano, at the moment, she tells me she's reading it to all her family at night time. She's got the Kindle version. Chapter by chapter. <laughs> and Mika... She typed it for me. I wrote longhand because I'm slow at typing and it just downloads very quickly. One point in time uh, when I was going through a bit of a hard patch, I used to journal of a morning, get up earlier and write. So that was in your 40s, wasn't it? Write three pages of whatever just came into my mind. And that's a really good a thing for anyone and everyone to do, even if they're not going through a hard time. It just empties your mind of all the, the thoughts that you have 
going through your head and you just put anything down on paper and it frees up your day to so you can be a lot more productive and a lot happier and because it really uh, gets in touch with your soul doesn't it yeah and when i was writing the book there were some things there that i just had completely forgotten about names were coming back to me who people i had forgotten they just downloaded on the paper in front of me it was amazing it's one of the most rewarding rewarding things you can do for yourself and i was sitting alone in front of the fire writing away and i felt the happiest i've felt ever in my life probably so why uh, haven't you written any more pete <laughs> Um, I, if you knew the I, answer I, to that question, yeah, I, I, I want to, I mm -hmm. want to get time. So if you die tomorrow, would you regret that you haven't written another book? I would like to write the next chapter mm -hmm. of our, my version of our married life. I ended my book by saying you can now go on and read Grada's memoir, which started probably when. The accident more or less started when we met, <laughs> when which we is met. completely non-intentional, by the way. No. I wrote my book in 2016 or something, the bulk of it, but I didn't publish it till last year. So my book has been in circulation for well over a year now. It's called You Are the Miracle, uh, How Being Hit by a Truck Saved My Life. Also very, very personal, by the way, so, because uh, Peter and I, we both decided if we were going to write a book and make it, um, rewarding we and uh, we had to be really really completely honest with ourselves and not dry clean any parts of our lives because otherwise it's not really much point doing it because it's all about being honest mm. with yourself and when you do that you actually start to connect lots of dots because Peter uh, when, after he read no actually when he started to write he realized all these connections through his life and his own behaviors and uh, um, the way he related to situations and sometimes his difficult behaviors, hey, how you got mm. tangled up, mm. made perfect sense how he arrived at those points in his life and really helped you to love yourself a lot more than yeah. dinner. And yeah, it just freed, made me feel a lot happier and freer. And if it, if it only helped me, it was well worth it, but I hope that it would help a lot of other people and I'm, oh. I'm sure it will. Lots of other people could probably relate to it yeah. because my, the title of my book was, is called The Red Coat. And, but the and subtitle is The subtitle is, more... is uh, Surviving the Loneliness of Growing Up in the Secret Sect, which we, I was brought up in a very strict, secret, religious, Christian sect, and the it, same sect as me. That's how we met on, each other on the other other side of the world, and it was very lonely. We weren't allowed to do things that other kids at school did, and had a big effect. I, I was very lonely a lot of my life, and that kind of continued on. I. We were made feel guilty for watching television, and and I remember I wrote in in the memoir about swearing at a boy in primary school. It's as clear in the mind today, and I felt as guilty as hell <laughs> yeah. for a long time after I. Actually, swore. Peter and I still feel guilty every day. Peter doesn't even realise yet. We are still freeing ourselves from the constraint of the church and even talking about it now, to be completely honest with you, makes us feel guilty and uncomfortable. I, I can feel myself, yeah, yeah. warm, feel yeah, it's, really it's warming. It's shame, that's called <laughs> yeah, shame. Yeah. Um, because we only left the church uh, in 2017, which isn't even that long ago, and our children got the same upbringing. So... In the end, the reason Peter and I left the church, which is actually was in the end very traumatic, we were thinking about it for about 10 years, but people didn't realize how much we were thinking about it. But in the end, we realized 
we simply can't grow anymore without stepping out of that culture because a sect another word for sect is cult which is short for culture which is like really really strict beliefs that we had to adhere to and if you didn't adhere to it uh, there were consequences right so we were also always living in fear of those consequences mm. like either that would be implemented by the church like maybe excommunicated or we were silenced inside the church or the other thing would be uh, well we didn't know what would happen to us if we stepped outside the church uh, because we, um, you know people think um, God could strike you down or you know, bad things are going to happen to you that's all such deeply deeply ingrained uh, conditioning and so um, I, I, on the other hand, I did have a good childhood. That's right. And, That's and it, and it, it was very, the, the group of people were beautiful really people. beautiful people, they loving, still loving, are very and, beautiful, yeah. intelligent uh, people of all walks of life. And, so, yeah. Um, so like professional people, engineers, doctors, as well as you know all kinds of people who, um who are converted to it or they born in the sect. And when Peter and I left, it was our biggest heartbreak that um, we caused um, our friends a, a heartache because now we actually don't have to do with them anymore because I guess uh, our ex-friends think that we might contaminate them. Nobody's ever asked us why we left. If it's just we left and then it's kind of, we don't belong there anymore and nobody asks questions. Because people don't want to hear what we think in case they might start to ask some questions to mm. So this is all very, very convoluted. And um, even though Peter and I have always been quite liberal in questioning within ourselves and within our family, and we've had a lot of honesty inside our own family, um, it's still you actually don't feel liberated till you step out of that environment. And you stop being uh, gaslighted, I guess, is the word really we're thinking of, isn't mm. it, Pete? Yeah. Still took us, you know, a good couple of years to get a real good grip of of reality and, and, and freedom, like Fe a sense feeling, of freedom. Feeling, yeah, that sense of freedom. and Free to think what we like, free yeah. to question what we like, free to explore. It was more that we felt really trapped in the way we had to think all the time. And, and mm. speak and, mm. yeah things we'd say yeah. and so do. ironically yeah. when I wrote my book I was still in the church which also made me feel a little bit gagged which is funny because now the guff I step out of that culture or cult or the sect and now the government is stopping me from sharing with you all the things I feel passionate about about health but anyway so we want to start to go more into personal stuff so Pete I just want to go back to Peter now um, the book, when you were writing the book, there were some really, really challenging things you had to write about. So can you mention probably um, the two, one was the biggest heartbreak of your life. And the reason, by the way, people why I asked that is because our heart center, if you want to live from your heart, which is I recommend that everyone does, gets closed down by grief and sadness. And it's like sadness and loss that we don't want to look at so when clients mm. come to me i always one of the first questions uh if it's the right time and safe enough i'll say what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you and we put all the cards on the table so we can start healing start doing deep healing straight away so i'm going to pretend pete is a new client and i'll say to <laughs> pete um what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you and can you share that with us when i was 19 i was in a a rafting accident on the fourth river and I lost my best mate and he drowned I survived I almost died of hypothermia came to in the hospital and asked people where my mate was and initially they wouldn't tell me and okay, I'll say the name and I asked where Mick was and they they said they just walked out. They left me alone. And he, he had died in the river and I was in hospital. I, I'm not sure how long I had been there, but I was all alone. I was, 
I, when I wrote my memoir, it came to me, why, why was I there all alone? I was, it was one of the most devastating times of my life. And here I was all alone. Freezing cold. There wasn't any of my friends there, any of the church. They all would have known, they would have heard. And eventually a doctor came in and I asked him and he said that it was too late for Mick. He, he had died and walked out again, left me alone again. Mm -hmm. So it, And I, I, the grief and guilt that I felt in that time overshadowed my life, my relationships, my family life for how many years? 20? 25 years. 20, probably. 25 years before I really somehow come to grips with it and it, uh, yeah, disappeared. Actually, Peter came to grips with it probably just before I had my track accident. Yeah. So, um, um, that whole period of time from when Peter was 19 till he was probably uh, 45 or something like that, he was living in constriction, you could say. Mm. But because I met Pete after the accident, I didn't really know him other than that. And I just loved him the way he was, although at times I would always <laughs> try to crack him open. <laughs> but well, I just couldn't it, crack it, him. it would have been unbearable for... Yeah. I used to go into really black, deep... Uh, periods of deep despair and blackness and... Even though he had like... Um, I, a loving yeah. wife and six loving children yeah. and all the rest was good. So uh, it was pretty intense, wasn't it, Pete? It was. And so I, I hated being there, but I just couldn't... It was just... Active, yeah. A sense of total rejection yeah. of the self, I'd say. Anyway, so Peter um, got th started to get through that in his 40s when he, when he started to face his demons. And you also started to write in a journal then, and that really, yeah. really helped in it. Yeah. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you a little bit, what did you think uh, when Mick died? The reason I want to go into this is as well, because in the last three months, Pete and I have um, been working with clients who have lost very close loved ones. Recently, that seems to be a theme, doesn't it, Pete? Yeah, and, and in the last six months, even so, a lot of our clients have lost many, either their spouse, or um, or siblings, or or close people that they really, really loved, and they're going through deep anguish. So we actually want to share a little bit of our own personal experience, of what it was like, and also I'm going to ask Pete what it was like. Um, what was it like to nearly die from hypothermia? Can you remember a bit about that experience? Just so you know, to demystify death a little bit. Well, it, it, it was, I have quite often said I would love to die that way because it was an amazing, peaceful, blissful experience. I just put my head on the side of the raft and everything just went totally peaceful. And then I couldn't remember anything. It just faded out. Beautiful. Yeah, because we often, <laughs> on when we're looking on, and I'm talking also now for my clients who are dealing with the pain of losing people, eh? people who suffer, when we're looking on, it looks awful, doesn't it? It looks as if people are suffering and struggling. But when you're on the inside of the dying process, it's actually completely different because... Um, when I had a near-death experience after I got hit by the truck, I also, it was the most beautiful, peaceful, uh, how, what's the word, experience. Like, I just dropped into my soul, like I, I left my body, met my own soul, and um, felt a complete shift of consciousness. I became completely, uh, what's the word, fearless, like, Fear wasn't part of me anymore, and that's when I realized that when we're in a body, we are so controlled by fear. So, 
It was just a beautiful state of being where everything was in order, like even everything on the whole planet was in order because of always being conscious of so much trouble in the world. That's how we grew up as well, by the way, to believe that the world was a place of trouble and of evil. And that was just... The universe was against us, yeah, not for us. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. When I had a near-death experience that everything was turned on its head and I got a taste of unconditional love and support. And I also realized that state of being is always there. I can drop into that any time of the day if I choose to do so, right? And we all can. So, um, Peter, I wanted to ask you, when you saw Mick then, when Peter had to say goodbye to Mick, what was the experience of that? I saw his body in the coffin and Mick wasn't there. It was just his shell was there, his body. But, and I said to Debbie's sister, I said, Mick's, he's not there, he's gone. Yeah. He's not there. <laughs> but she thought I had gone crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing. Because I, I, it gave me, it, it made me feel excited in a way. Because he think, also looked peaceful. Didn't yeah, he, he was as peace, his, his body looked really peaceful. And we were speaking recently to a friend of Grada's who saw a brother after, after, he'd he'd, committed suicide. after he'd committed suicide. And she said he was the most peaceful she had ever seen him. She didn't realise how much anguish he was in, in All his, his life. life. Yeah. And he was peaceful. Yeah. And it is a peaceful experience. Yeah. So we're just talking about yeah. it because we want you to feel less resistant and less fearful when it comes to thinking about death because um, it's different to what you might, it's completely different to what and you expect. For the, per for the person looking on, it's not nice, but for the person going through it, and yeah, it's, it's just a transition. of. It's a transformation. It's yeah, actually... Yeah. Um, a beautiful transformation mm -hmm. and also I would like you to consider the fact that sometimes people die so they can be really close to you all the time so they literally their soul to makes the decision they kind of opt out of this body so they can be closer to you all the time they never have to leave your side anymore so that's also a really nice comforting thought to to um, Remember that, that your loved ones have never, who have passed over, they don't leave your side. They stay with you all the time and they'll be with you when it's your t turn to transition. So, um, anyway. Quite, quite often uh, we relate our loved ones to certain things. Grada's mum, she loved the grey thrush, our native grey thrush in Tasmania, because it, she said it's, saying yo pretty yo was her name and she thought it was saying yo pretty so we whenever we hear that bird we say there's omar there's grada's mum and, and she it, uh, and and i can't, i truly believe that because sometimes we hear the grace rush at the really weird times of the day or night even sometimes and, and it's very apt times they, for instance when eve was giving <laughs> birth to bobby which was her first child and Arthur had just popped out to go to the shop to buy something, so she was all at home by herself. And her labour suddenly intensified. She could hear what we say, Alma, outside the bird was singing to her. And always my children, they know when, when they hear that bird now, they, they actually stop and ask themselves what's going on, what's going on for them, what's going on in their life, what's Alma trying to tell them. And my father too, of course, I have felt his presence really, really strong since he passed over. And um, sometimes um, we, you smell something, so it's like a psychic smell, isn't it, mm. Pete? Um, one time we both woke <laughs> up uh, last year and I smelled this kind of aftershave smell. That, And then uh, I said to Pete, what's that smelling, Peter? Uh, I, I'd been smelling it. For, for a few mornings already. Yeah, for a little while. And I said, what, can you smell it too? It was nearly the exact same smell as my father's Old Spice aftershave. Uh, yeah, mm. so then we go, well, 
let's say it is your dad, right? Yeah. What's he trying to tell us? He's what? trying to make yeah. us aware of something. And it's always happening for you, right? You don't need to be scared and, and think, oh, it's a bad message here or something. It's usually uh, they want... They just want to reach out to you and mm. let you know you still deeply loved as much as before, if not more so, right? And I believe that at some level deep down in our soul, we all know that anyway. This is not something that we have to debate or anything like that. Um, so why are we talking about that now? <laughs> because I really, really want my clients or friends, people who are struggling with the loss of losing somebody and we living in an illusion where we think life ends that's it it's all over and then some people continue to live in a sense of regret because we think oh i didn't get to say goodbye or i didn't say that or this to the person you just can stop worrying mm. about it because right. once you die that matters nothing because the person who's transitioned um is now completely fulfilled and at peace and knows and accepts you for what you are unconditionally. So. I, I wish that I had been able to get rid of that grief and guilt years before. Yeah. So I could have had a... That's my main regret is not... Well, actually, how yeah. it affected the children yeah. is probably more well, your regret. It, yeah, it's, it affected, yeah, all... All our family, really, my the black moods I used to drop into. Mm -hmm. But uh, but our kids actually yeah. love Peter just the way he is too, and they learned from it. So if we want to say another uh, helpful hint to you uh, as parents, you don't need to behave in a certain way, like you don't need to be the parent or anything. You just need to be yourself. Be yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's the greatest gift yeah. you can give to your children. Be your best self, I would and, say. And write, write your story for your children yeah. so they can Understand remember you. it and your grandchildren can read it after them. Yeah, leave, that's yeah. a beautiful leave, legacy. Leave your legacy for them. It's because one of the most amazing things you can do for yourself as well. I, I really would encourage each one of you to write your story. Yeah, even yeah. if you think you have nothing to say, your life has been ordinary... Well, there's actually no such thing as an ordinary yeah. life. Of course, everyone is exceptional. Uh, everyone is like a beautiful soul. All of you are beautiful souls. And you came here with a special gift, you know, that you're mm. still unwrapping. And when you start writing, it's like unwrapping that beautiful gift. And then, honestly, you could keep writing because it's more and more that mm. keeps coming up all the time that really makes so much sense to you it helps other people how i wrote i i had some music running in the background that got me into a meditative state and it all flowed from my heart and you yeah and it didn't, was didn't, surprised actually <laughs> yeah I, because i'm a yeah slow writer slow reader and and it just i just wrote for five or six hours just non-stop and you actually wrote the and, whole book in five days which is pretty amazing yeah Okay, so um, is there anything else we need to say? We've sort of gone off on different tangents, but anyway, hope you enjoy this uh, Facebook Live. It's about life in all its rawness, isn't it? And honesty. So there's only really one way to live your life, and that's just being honest with yourself. And be, be yourself. And you're well. totally mm. lovable, regardless of your black moods or <laughs> whatever. And, and love, love yourself. Yeah, that's, that's right. This I wrote in the book. I thank Grada for for the one that's helped me to come to love myself, and so I know that I'm never alone. I I've got me with me all the time. That's right, because you're married <laughs> to yourself in because, the first place. Because I I was neglecting myself all those years as mm -hmm. well. When you love well, yourself, you mm -hmm. don't feel needy, and your partner will love you even more because then it's a different type of love. It's not a needy love. Mm. Yeah? So um, give yourself permission to love yourself. By the way, in our church, that was really frowned upon. So everything was very convoluted. And we really had to navigate our way 
through we were really lost in the forest for many many years like trying to find uh true peace and um true what's the word be true to ourselves at the same time and it was just so many conflicting messages all the time and when things didn't work for us we were always questioning ourselves but we weren't really questioning what we should have questioned which was actually uh the church i guess really happy anyway so i guess the, here's another thing always question everything turn everything on its head i usually say to turn things on the things you believe the things that you've believed since you were a little child turn it on its head just for fun and see if that's not closer to the truth right because your own internal navigator will tell you mm, that actually feels better or that makes more sense and that's how you can find your way out again so thank you for tuning yep. in and um hope you I'll, enjoy my book <laughs> <laughs> i'll post the, i'm sure you will it's just a little book you can read it in the night if your tissues ready and it also uh it's quite funny when we read it because um we realized now peter being 60 you know that 60 years ago things were incredibly different than today it's, it's so life it's a life into the past life really. life growing up in tasmania 60 years ago so it, it gives a bit of an insight into yeah. how life on a farm was like as well as number yeah. seven <laughs> as well eh? in the family yeah. with mostly boys okay so thanks for tuning in i'll post the link so you can uh, already read the book on kindle if you want to i think it's what six dollars or four dollars to download or something like that and the hard copy should be out very very soon anyway if you have any questions regarding your own personal or spiritual journey um you can put it in the comments and we are still in the process of deleting posts from our facebook page and from the website i think most educational posts have already disappeared and we're just going with it with the flow at the moment we're not going to put up a fight or anything right now and we've put all those articles in the freezer in case one day we wake up and we're living in an uncensored world we can post <laughs> them again Okay, thanks mm. for tuning in, everyone. All and right. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Good. Bye. Yep. Have Bye. a good week. Thank Bye. you. Bye.